I'll start at the start and kind of build it up. So what I'm here to do, I'm here to talk about germs. And so what are germs? And so these tiny little invisible things that lurk everywhere, and, and hopefully I don't turn you into germaphobes. I myself am not a germaphobe, even though I'm going to talk like I am. Um, and so they're everywhere, and certainly in terms of human beings. And so we are covered with these things. Our mouths, there's an old adage where I'd rather be bitten by a dog than a human. It's absolutely true. Human mouths are full of things you wouldn't want to, to have. Um, and our hands are unfortunately covered in all kinds of nasty things. And so germs are everywhere. We can't see them. Um, and so there are four kinds of germs. And so this is one of the things, because you kind of get to the point about antibiotics through this, is there are four kinds. There's viruses, things like HIV, flu, cold. Um, there are fungi that can have moldy type stuff. There are some pathogenic fungi, candida and things like that, but typically it's the stuff that spoils your food and actually makes pretty cool antibiotics. There are parasites. This one is actually the, um, the uh, malaria parasite, and so some pretty unpleasant things that are parasitic. But for my purposes, and the thing that I'm completely obsessed with is bacteria. And so I'm here to talk to you about bacteria, distinction from fungi and viruses, etc. And so um, to give you a kind of a proportion of scale type thing, the things that I work on, and so this is all to scale. This will be a human skin cell, and so... Next to that is the human blood cell, so one of our erythrocytes are much smaller. And then actually the bug that I work on, Staph aureus, is, is that size. And so kind of a tenth the size of your blood cells and maybe 50 to 100 times smaller than just one of our basic cells. And so just a tiny little thing, maybe 100 times smaller than our own individual cells. But it's not really about size, it's about number. And so when one considers the human body, you are 10 times more bacteria than you are human being. You are full of bacteria. There are somewhere in the 10 to the 14 range bacterial cells in your body and only 10 to the 13 of your own. And so you're more bacteria than you are human. And about 1 to 3% of our body mass is made up of these little things that live inside us. And so our entire body is contains within and on bacteria. And so I like to put this picture up just kind of to give a, uh, some credit to bacteria. If one looks at kind of the 5, million, uh, five billion year old um, planet type idea, bacteria showed up and evolved about 3.8 billion years ago on the planet. And so they've been around for a very long time. And if you look at us up there, humans, the, the, the Homo line derived about 2.3 million years ago, and, and Homo sapiens only 250,000 years ago. And so 4 billion years, 250,000 years. And so they've been around on this planet by themselves for an awful long time. And so everything that we think we do can do, everything we think we know for as smart as we are, these guys have seen it all before. They've been sat around here for 4 billion years. And so they're infinitely smarter than we are, even though they're 100 times smaller than we are and just at the cell basis. And so I put this picture up and it kind of, ooh, I'm going backwards. Uh, so I put this picture up, it's a picture hanging in a gallery in Madrid, and it shows that we've been living with bacteria for an awful long time. Uh, this is um, depicting the Black Plague, which killed about um, a half of Europe. And so this was caused by the bacteria Yersinia pestis, and it's no longer really an issue today, but it was a huge problem back in the 1500s. And so we've seen bacterial infections, we've lived with it for an awful long time. And so in terms of this country and bacterial infections, I can tell you every single year in this country, and these are probably low estimate numbers, two million people a year get a bacterial infection in the United States. And to put that in perspective for you, that's like the entire city of Houston every year getting a bacterial infection, or in all of Nebraska. So two million people. It's like just putting all the infections in Nebraska and saying, you guys keep them, we don't want them, you're in the middle of the country. So the entirety of Nebraska every year gets an infection. More soberly, who dies from them? And so 100,000 people a year in this country die from bacterial infections. And again, those numbers are probably much lower than the reality. Um, and to give you a, a frame of reference, let's look at West Palm Beach. It's like people, everyone in West Palm Beach dying every year from bacterial infections. And even more soberly, um, while we're sat here tonight having dinner, 50 people died from bacterial infections. Just for a two-hour dinner on one day, 50 people have died from bacterial infections. And some of this is so unfortunate, and you, you, many of you may have already seen this. On Monday, the CDC waged war on this, this huge publicity campaign about drug-resistant bacterial infections, and so they came out with some pretty cool new numbers. Of those 100,000 people that die every year from a bacterial infection, a quarter of them, to almost 25,000 of those infections, are completely, they, people, these people don't need to die. This is because their infections with antibiotic-resistant bacteria where we have absolutely nothing left. If we had a drug to treat, you could give it to the person, you save 25,000 lives. 25,000 people a year die because we just have nothing left in the, the closet for treatment. 100,000 people die in general, but 25,000 people needlessly die because we have no drugs. And so this kind of shows how premature this statement was, which came from the US Surgeon General that essentially said, in 1967, we got it beat, infection's over, well done, close the book. 
Um, and unfortunately, the guy has lived to, to, to regret seeing that, um, as I'll show you. And so I like to tell people why I do what I do. And it's one of those things like, well, you spend all this time looking at bacteria, although I don't. My students at the back who are hiding from publicity, Whitney and Christina back there, these guys work with bacteria. I don't anymore. But So why do I do what I do? And so I, I show you here a picture of a normal human hip. And so this is a diseased human hip. So when I was 13, see how the cap is not in line? It fell off the femur. And so that's what happened to me. My left hip, the, the, the cap just kind of completely fell off. And, and so if you put it back on, it just keeps falling off and keeps grinding into your pelvis. And so what they have to do is to pin it. You have to put the cap back on and stick pins into the, the, the bone and make sure it sticks. Now, I've talked to a lot of infectious disease doctors, and they tell me that pretty much everything that goes into the human body is contaminated. And so unfortunately, what happens are you get these biofilm infections. So these little bacteria are on those pins that go into your hip. And I have three pins in my hip, or now I only have one. And two of them had a really horrible biofilm infection. And so I spent an awful lot of time in hospital uh, taking an awful lot of antibiotics. And so from the age of 13 to 18, the pins were in my hip. I had a constant bacterial infection. And so that was my life. And so the idea of bacterial infections acquired from hospital is not new to me. And so that's where I get to this guy. And so this is, um, and I truly apologize if someone in the room has been affected by MRSA, because more often than not, they have been. I talk about this little guy like he's a member of the family, but this is Staph aureus, and he is a superbug, and you can tell because he has a cape, and so there he is, he's a superbug. Um, and so this is actually a giant microbe, it's a little kind of stuffed toy I have at my office desk. My first honor student gave it to me when she graduated. And so Staphylococcus means kind of golden bunches of grapes, and so that's where its name comes from. Um, and so most people say, well, he's just a little bacteria, I'm not that impressed by it. Well, I say, well, he can do this. And so most people are like, well, big deal, and so he can do it backwards too. And then I conclude, because no one else in the room was able to do that, that the bacteria is actually better than the audience. So superbug indeed. And so uh, this thing is present everywhere. So this bacteria I work on, Staph aureus, or MRSA, or MRSA, MRSA is probably what I'll call it, or Staph, um, is present absolutely everywhere on the planet. It's ubiquitous. And so you find it in soil, you find it in water, you find it in sewage, and particularly in Florida, this is a problem to us. When we get sewage outbreaks onto beaches, lots of papers published in the state of Florida showing all kinds of MRSA and other bacteria that shouldn't be there. And you find it in the air, too. This thing is everywhere. And also, finally, you also find it in my brother. Um, <laughs> and what I mean, not really my brother, I mean human beings. And so one in three people carry MRSA and in, in the nose and in the air track. And so in this room now, one in three of us carry it. And I have in the past been a carrier for Staph aureus. So it just sits there, kind of quite harmlessly, doing nothing, what we call commensal, not causing infection. But he's sat there and um, waiting to come out. And so if one looks at the global picture of infectious disease, um, so uh, the, the problems that really cause problems in mankind are malaria, HIV, cholera, TB, uh, hepatitis. These are the global problems. But if we can just for a second get American-centric, uh, as we tend to do from time to time, and I'm an American citizen now too, let's just delete the rest of the entire world for a moment. <laughs> and you'll see I deleted Florida. I just didn't want to go back and remake the slide. It was too much ha hassle. So let's just focus solely on the United States. The leading cause of infectious disease and death in this country by an infectious agent is Staph aureus. HIV kills about 18,000 people. MRSA kills about 20,000 people. And if you look at Staph aureus infections as a whole, maybe even 30,000, 40,000. So no other infectious agent that you can come close to thinking of kills as many people as Staph aureus. And so if I haven't made my point, I'll make it again. The leading cause of infectious disease and death in this country is caused by this bacterium that my lab works on, Staph aureus. Here's the pictures. You ready? So one of the cool things about this bacterium is that it's not a one-trick pony. Most things, most bacteria that, that cause infections are one-trick ponies. They, they can kill you one way, and you've all heard of anthrax. You're all scared of anthrax, but it does one thing. It gets into the bloodstream, kind of circulates around, comes back to your lungs, fills them up with fluid, you drown. That's all it does, and if you can stop it doing that, it's not a problem. This bacterium can cause infection in every single part of the body, and it's a unique trait. And so often they start out as basic um, kind of skin um, and, and boils and abscesses, so things like this. And so you can get these pretty much anywhere on the body, and they, they get worse, so you might want to look away. The room agreed to the pictures. Let's go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> so they can start out like this. Anywhere in your body you can get something like this, a boil, an abscess, and that's really not that, that bad. Impetigo, cellulitis, deep-seated pyomyelitis into the muscle. Um, just a, uh, a hair follicle can get infected. It's called a skin syndrome. This is kind of a, a cool one because... It affects newborn babies, and so what it is, it's, it's toxin that cleaves parts of the skin, and so it looks like you've got third-degree burns, and this patient is actually kind of unique because they're a lot older, but um, newborn babies get this, and the whole body will cover in third-degree burns. And so back in the 60s, uh, family services were taking children away from their parents, saying, you poured boiling water on your children, 
and it was a bacterial infection. It's just caused by this one toxin the bacteria makes. And so all different kinds of things just locally on your body it can cause. And then it gets a little worse. And so um, it can cause necrotizing fasciitis. And so necrotizing fasciitis is death and necrosis of the fascia. That's the skin tissue, and this stuff doesn't come back. And so um, this is loss of an entire foot and shin. And this stuff can lead to amputations, and that stuff doesn't come back. And that's only the second worst picture I've ever seen of necrotizing fasciitis. The worst one is someone with half of their face missing. That stuff doesn't come back. And so this thing causes some pretty mean infections, and we're not even done yet. Um, once you've finished with the skin, you can get into the blood, and the blood goes everywhere in the body, and so now you can go to every single part of the body and cause new fun and disease. And so we use the skeleton. I used to use my brother as a, an example of a human being, but um, as you've seen, I'm not sure that he is. So um, we use the skeleton. And so it can go to your brain, and it can cause meningitis, which is basic meningitis, which will kill you, or it can cause a brain abscess. And so we do this. We put the bacteria into, into mice and watch it just disappear to all the organs, and it loves to go to every single one of the organs and just hide and hang out and multiply. And so what it does, it'll go to the brain, and you can see these kind of swollen areas, forms these kind of areas of infection, so you get bugs divide and divide and divide, and they get it's a huge masses of infection, and then they rupture, and then they disappear around the body. But if that rupture occurs on a thought center of the brain, that doesn't come back. And so, and this is a huge problem where you get abscesses on people's brains. It can go to your heart and cause endocarditis. And so what this does is it likes to go to the heart valves and kind of form a biofilm on them, and it just eats your heart valve. And when you don't have heart valves, you then have a heart attack and you die. And it was actually, what, I think, two weeks into my starting at USF in 2007, I was in a classroom with a student who afterwards came up to me and said, yeah, I had staph endocarditis. And I was how are you still walking? I mean, people die from this, but remarkably, she survived. It was amazing. It can go to your lungs, cause basic old garden variety pneumonia, which is not a lot of fun, and then cause necrotizing pneumonia. You see this black area of this lung here? That's dead lung tissue. It no longer works. It doesn't grow back. It doesn't come back. And we see infections with this kind of thing and people dying in 36 hours, from inoculation to infection to death in 36 hours. That's anthrax quick at killing. And this is our leading cause of death in this country. It can go to any one of your bones and cause osteomyelitis. Diabetic patients lose their limbs because of staph aureus infections. You lose sensitivity in your limbs. Uh, you're immunocompromised because you're diabetic. Uh, and then staph aureus, you get a bone infection, and it goes into your bones and just eats them. And so osteomyelitis, and this one deeply not pleasant, septic arthritis. And so all of our joints, as we use them, they age and they wear down, and they, they're, they're not so functional. Well, this, this bug just goes to the joints and eats your joints. Your, your kind of cartilage and, and the, the, the synovial tissues in there just destroys them and eats them. And so then you get septic infectious um, arthritis. I'm done with the pictures. And so then it can also, <laughs> some people are like, no, I want more. Others are like, oh, thank goodness. Um, food poisoning. And so it's a top 10 cause of food poisoning. I think the seventh leading cause in this country. It's about, I think, a billion dollar problem a year. We don't even think about that in the staff world. We've got a lot worse issues to be thinking about than food poisoning. Another famous one that it causes is toxic shock syndrome. We should have all heard of that one. It's very serious. A lot of people die from that. This is the bug that causes toxic shock syndrome. And every single day when I'm looking at the scientific literature, looking at new things about what Staph aureus does, I'm finding new things it's the leading cause of. And so I think it should be relatively obvious why this guy is the leading cause of infectious disease and death because it does so many things, and it really is unique in that regard. And so this is a big science picture, and I put this up. So why does it do this? And so every single one of these words you can consider as just being something that it can use. And so I put this picture down here. See this little cannon of Wiley Coyote? These little things are like cannonballs that it's firing out into the human body to try and attack you in some way. And so it's just got tons of different things that it can use to start attacking the human host, to generate food, and to, to facilitate not dying. And, and it has more than any other bacteria. And so that's really just a unique thing that it does. Well, you say, well, okay, well, that's fine then. You know, your bacterial infections, we know about those. It's all right. We'll just give antibiotics and we'll be, we'll be good. And we know that that's not true. And so this is a, I like to give kind of a little quick history on this. The first recorded use of an antibiotic was in 1942, and Chief Miller in Salisbury, Connecticut. She was hours from death. And it was actually a streptococcus infection, not a staphylococcus infection, so a different bug. Um, and it wasn't approved. Penicillin wasn't approved at the time, but the, the doctors just said, give it to her. I mean, she's, she's going to die. Just give it to her. Within 12 hours, she's perky, she's fine, and she, she lived to be an old lady. And so here she is. She lived well into her 80s, and that's Alexander Fleming, the guy who discovered penicillin. Um, he got to meet her, so the first recorded use there. If one looks at the science for a moment, though, the first recorded case of a bacteria that was resistant to an antibiotic was Staph aureus. And so in 1944, there was a publication in Science that said, we just found a bacterium that now beats the wonder drug penicillin. So if you've ever published a paper, you know that it probably takes a year to get the paper published. So used in 1942, 1943 probably is when resistance occurred. 
And the first recorded use was a streptococcus infection, not a staphylococcus infection, a completely different bug to this one, yet this guy beats it. And honestly, you can still use penicillin against streptococcal infections today. It's not a problem because it's not really resistant. And so this is a slide I had one of my students make a couple of years ago, and then a slide I had another one of my students update. And so what this does on the top is tell you when an antibiotic was introduced. And then on the bottom it tells you when staph aureus beat that antibiotic. And so there you can see right away is penicillin. And unfortunately the common theme in this table is pretty much 12 months to resistance. Some, and I'll explain a few in a moment, not so much, but almost every antibiotic introduced onto the market, at least in terms of staph aureus infections within a year, becomes kind of useless because it figured a way around it. Some of them are a little longer, something like Cipro. We don't really use Cipro for a staph infection because it's just terrible staph. You give Cipro to a staph infected patient, the bug mutates instantly. We have to use it in kind of a cocktail therapy. Same with rifampin. Vancomycin was kind of our last favorite one. We never really saw resistance with this, and we were thankful for it because it's all we had left. It's pretty toxic. It's not very nice. You don't give it to people unless you have to, but in the early 2000s, kind of worst case scenario happened. It beat vancomycin, and we're left kind of scratching our heads and thinking, oh, dear, that's all we had left. What are we going to do? There are some things like tigercycline, which actually still seem to work, but there is not a lot. Daptomycin, linozole, these things are brand new designer antibiotics, and they're just gone within 12 months. And so to give you a context of the problem, these are drug companies, Big Pharma, that were working, and this slide's probably maybe in 20 years uh, ago now. I stole this from Steve Projan, who used to be head of drug development at Wyeth uh, about five, 10 years ago. These were the companies that were working on antibiotics, um, and this is what they're doing today. And the short and sweet answer is they're doing nothing. Not a single Big Pharma is really working on antibiotics now. And some of them will tell you that they are, and there's four or five companies kind of seriously thinking about it. Some small biotechs and startups, but... Big Pharma, as, as, a, as a rule, has pretty much shut down antimicrobial therapy. It just doesn't do it anymore. Um, and you might ask the question, why? Why does it not make antibiotics anymore? There's obviously a problem, and the answer is half a billion dollars. Um, in the first year of a new antibiotic release to the market, the drug company has to make half a billion dollars back. That's FDA trials, its shareholders, its marketing, its research and development. They need to make the cash, and I completely understand they're a business. They've got to pay, pay back what they spent. The trouble is, if the bacteria are going to beat the antibiotic in 12 months from introduction, you're not going to get your half billion dollars. And so there's no economic model that makes sense for antibiotic development. Drug companies would really much rather sell you a statin drug for 30 years to lower your cholesterol than an antibiotic for a week that probably won't work. And so, and, and, and that's not castigating pharma, that's entirely their, their want. You know, that's their profit-driven, model-driven, that's the way they have to work, but it just doesn't work in terms of human health, in terms of human uh, infections and antibiotic resistance. And so this is what happened. This is what pharma did. They pretty much just all ran away and said, no, forget it, we're out. Um, which left guys like me in academia saying, where did everybody go? <laughs> and I can prove it. And so this is um, a chart. This is FDA approvals of new antibiotics over time. And so you can see 2008, 2009, the FDA approved one single antibiotic. And I'm not sure they've approved one since maybe 2010. Was that when DAPTO came out maybe? But you can see a clear trend on this graph of approved antibiotics by the FDA. And this, I know it's kind of hard to see, it's not really supposed to see too much of it. It shows kind of the timeline of an development of antibiotics, that penicillin and the sulfur drugs were the early ones. And this, God, I would love to have been working at that time. That was the golden age of antibiotics. You could find those things without even trying at that point. It was amazing. And they give you Nobel Prizes for it too. People got Nobel Prizes in this era. But, and so, and, and that's actually kind of interesting. You know, the guy that said we're done with infection, he said it right there. And that was at the kind of end of the golden era, and look how it just completely peters out. So he spoke just a little too soon. And so the void is the problem. You know, I think this is wrong. I think daptomycin was discovered somewhere in here, but pretty much nothing happened in the last 15 years. And so you, know, you can see the effects started in the late 80s. You know, the late 80s was, well, we're still approving drugs, but we haven't discovered anything. And you can see how that void has kicked into the point now where that graph is at zero. And so, no new drugs approved by the FDA to treat drug-resistant infections when 100,000 deaths occur every year and 2 million people get them. And kind of another way of looking at it, there's that um, approval line here, and here's the increase in drug resistance, and that top line is Staph aureus, and the bottom line is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is another really un unpleasant, scary bug, and you, know, you don't need me to tell you that those lines are going in the wrong directions. Bugs are getting more resistant, we have no drugs. It's a very simple answer. As I said, this is not my data, this is stuff pulled from the CDC and the NIH. This is exactly what is happening right now. You, you might say, well, okay, well, that's fine. You know, you've got an infection, you get a vaccine, that's fine. We take vaccines and we're good. Well, vaccines um, don't really work. And so this is a list of all the people who've tried to make a vaccine against Staph aureus in the last 15 years. A lot of big pharma, a lot of small companies, a lot of universities. And every single one of them has failed. 
uh, they've lost a lot of money and a lot of time and look very silly trying to do something that is absolutely required. It just doesn't work. And I think it comes back to that causes infection in every part of the body thing. You know, you can have an anthrax vaccine because you target the anthrax toxin, it doesn't do what it did. There's no one thing you can target with Staph aureus that makes all of this stuff go away. And so vaccination isn't going to work. And so it's actually, I went to a conference in Panama. I was invited last year to go and talk and it was a conference about vaccine development and there was dengue there and there was all the, the big serious the bugs and everyone was talking positively about vaccines and hey, we've got a new vaccine and it's working. And I kind of went and told them straight and said, look, it ain't happening. And they kind of looked at me like, he said, what? <laughs> and they came up to me afterwards like, well, that was very brave of you. It's the truth. Vaccines don't seem to work with Staph aureus. And so another consideration is that Staph aureus MRSA used to be a hospital problem, and, and people from hospitals here know that all too well. You go to a hospital and it's full of very sick people and very healthy bacteria. And, uh, but we saw a change, and it's, it's again unique to the United States about at the start of the 2000s, a massive rise in community-associated infections. And so young healthy people out in the community college, students is a great example of that, just getting really severe Staph aureus diseases and dying. And we never used to see that before. You'd only see it in hospitals. And so we've saw, seen this change in kind of molecular epidemiology, the way the bug behaves, the way it, it's just changing and adapting. And so if you think this little guy's scary, this one's much worse. And so these are the community-associated strains of Staph aureus. And these guys are crazy, just like tearaway teenagers. <coughs> these are the guys causing death in 36 hours from infection, not the, well, okay, I'll give you an infection for about four months and you won't like it, but you're not dead. These guys are just wandering around killing people. And, and scarily, if you get an infection with one of these strains, and it's the strains that my lab primarily works on, the first place you go is a hospital because you want to get treated. And so you t we're taking in two hospitals, these horrible community strains, and they're beginning to beat up and displace those hospital-acquired strains. These guys were awful and might have killed you. These guys absolutely will. And they're now the new spreading epidemic clones, and it's only in this country where it happens. And so um, just a little bit of an addition to that. The screen's just can't turn that off. Um, is that it's not just Staph aureus. Staph aureus really is the major problem, and it's my kind of favorite bacterium that I've been working on forever. But there are more than just Staph aureus that are causing these issues. And so this was a, a report by the Infectious Disease Society of America. And so I give them full credit. I stole the bad bugs, no drugs thing. It's, it's cool and I use it which was a report um, commissioned about the public health crisis that's, that's currently ongoing. And, and they have this thing that they want to see 10 new antibiotics by 2020 and, or 2013, and I don't see any. This is a noble and, and wonderful cause. I just, it was ambitious and I don't see it happening. And so they, they came up with this idea about a, a lack of federal funding for something, not just Staph aureus, but they call these escape pathogens. And they've had a lot of papers that say, look, we have these problems with escape pathogens. And so what are the escape pathogens? And so that's kind of what my lab's moved towards. And so, uh, E-S-K-A-P-E. -E. Each letter is a different bacteria. So these are the top six bacteria that cause two-thirds of all hospital-acquired infections in this country. So two-thirds of all those numbers that I've told you about, these guys cause them. And so Staph aureus, that's my guy there. He's the worst of the lot, but he has five other brothers that are just as mean. And so I'll kind of touch on some of those guys right now. Um, Klebsiella pneumoniae and Enterobacter cloaceae. These are both are called carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae. It's a lot of science stuff I don't know, but... These guys, this, the director of the CDC two years ago called these guys the nightmare bacteria. And staph is bad, but every now and again we can find something to treat with. Cleb and Enterobacter, these guys are absolutely awful. So these guys were referred to as nightmare bacteria. As I said, if you saw anything from the CDC that came out on Monday, and it's every single major news network this week is carrying the CDC stories, these guys were the worst. These were the ones that they're really, really concerned about. I mean, this guy's killing everyone, but these in the future could be the ones because we have no treatments left. Acinetobacter pneumoniae is an interesting one. So this guy's called Arachibacter. Um, that's its nickname. And so it's a problem that it's not really, it wasn't really a US problem. It was affecting our troops in the Middle East, uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And they get these horrible, serious infections, super drug resistant infections. And this screen capture comes from a Nova um, a st a video story, a TV story about Arachibacter and how serious it was and how, how awful it is for the troops. And of course, the troops come back home, they bring it with them. And so now, Acinetobacter pneumoniae is a huge problem in this country, and we just got done with um, a study. My, my technician just ran the, the stuff this week, looking at um, what exactly is in a hospital ICU. We just went in there and just swabbed it, and we had this brand new wonderful machine that the dean helped us, well, the dean bought for us, and it's wonderful. And we said, all right, what's in there? And there is a ton of Acinetobacter pneumoniae. This just, what's in an ICU is a who's who of who you do not want there. It's frightening. Um, and another one to point out, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. This guy does not care about antibiotics. And so in my lab, we screen tens of thousands, if not millions of compounds, depending on the things that we're doing, looking for new drugs. 
and we had one drug. The only thing it did was it hit Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It didn't touch anything else whatsoever. We were really excited because you don't see this at all ever. And so you just can't find anything to treat infections. I'm telling you that Staph aureus is bad, and it is. It's the leading cause of death in this country. But in terms of what, if you get an infection, how you treat those 23,000 people dying because we can't find any drugs to treat them, Pseudomonas, the CREs, and staph, all of these guys. And so it's not just one bug, it's a collection of bugs. And so that's why in my lab we switched. We primarily focus on staph, but we now look at all of these because every single one of them is a major problem. And so I guess the question is, why do we have this problem? I mean, what, what causes this problem? And this was the World Health Organization, their World Health Day um, from a couple of years ago. And it does a pretty good job of saying it. I mean, lack of commitment. I mean, that's, that comes from patients, and that comes from doctors, and that comes from pharma. And I mean, people aren't committed to the problem. Lack of research. Well, not on my part, I'm trying, but there really is a, a lack of research and investment into it. Surveillance is a major problem, knowing that we've got these infections, being able to report them. Um, poor drug quality. Well, <laughs> we've got drugs that really don't work, and I've reviewed grants recently for the NIH for, for uh, colistin-type drugs, and you don't give colistin to anyone because it's super toxic, but the grant made a very good point. We got nothing else, so we might as well try colistin again. Um, no infection control, and some of that's coming now. We're seeing that if we begin to isolate patients and, and control infection, it makes better an irrational drug use, and I'll touch on some of it in the next few slides. And so overuse is certainly a major problem with what we've got right now. Um, this is a, uh, from 2004. Most of the numbers of these things are old, but this is not based on population, but per 1,000 inhabitants. And it's how many different antibiotics are prescribed per 1,000. And unfortunately, we're kind of high up on that graph. Um, it, it's not good. Greece is, is God knows what they're doing in Greece. Um, so this is a graph, a graph of um, a spread of drug-resistant MRSA in, uh, in Europe. And actually, Greece is down there as purple, and it's the hotspot. And so absolute science correlation right there. We prescribe more antibiotics than everyone else, and we have more MRSA than everyone else. And you can kind of wander around this kind of little scale and match it to countries, and Portugal and Spain and England are, are all pretty bad. And then this one's for carbapenem-resistant Enterobacteriaceae. Exactly, again, same correlation. Italy's really high up on there. Italy's got a major problem down here. And, and so there is a correlation between overprescription of antibiotics, and like I said, this is not population. This is per 1,000 people, so it's completely normalized. You know, and, and this is quite true. People often say to me, well, is the MRSA problem a global problem? And I say, well, Scandinavia seems, seems to have it figured out. The Netherlands, um, Norway, I mean, not Netherlands isn't Scandinavia, but Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and also Netherlands. These guys don't have too much of a problem or have a lot less of a problem, and maybe it's because they don't prescribe so many drugs. Some of this is misuse, and unfortunately, um, no amount of antibiotics is going to help you. You've got a cold or you've got flu or you've got a cough. And there's some good news and bad news on this, and so... The good news is that in the last 10 years, we've seen a 24% decrease in this country of prescriptions of antibiotics. But uh, a study suggests that 60% of all those that are prescribed are still completely useless. And so, but, I, but I've talked to MDs, and I understand this. Is if you've got a, a brand new mother, it's 4 o'clock in the morning, she has a, a two-month-old baby that's screaming his head off, and she thinks it's going to die, you're going to give her an antibiotic script because she thinks that that's what's going to help, and it's going to reassure her, and it might make the situation better. It leads to a much bigger problem down the line. But I can understand the motivation behind it, um, although, as I said, it's provably causing a problem. This is a, a fascinating cycle, and it's really kind of true. Not much other choice. And so uh, it doesn't matter where you start, what start. Well, increased antibiotic use. And so what that leads to is increased resistant bacteria. Well, and then what we have is drugs don't work anymore, and more people die. And so we have to give more antibiotics because we have to stop people dying. And then more people go to hospital, and we give them more antibiotics using more healthcare resources, and so then that means, well, you use more antibiotics, more people are dying, we still don't have much treatment to them, so let's use more antibiotics. And the cycle continues. It's, we're kind of trying to spend our way out of it, but you're going to do that versus dead people, and so it's an unfortunate situation. This could well be our major problem. 70% of all antibiotics produced in this country go to in, uh, agriculture. We're giving uh, pigs, cows, you're giving them antibiotics, and what it does is it leads to bigger yields. You get more um, weight, more meat from the animals because what you're doing is you're stripping them of all, all the microbes that are inside them. And those microbes were maybe nibbling off a little bit of food here and there to survive, but they were helping out the, the, the animal. 70% of them going into the food chain for absolutely no reason. And we, we did this strange thing the other day. One of my colleagues uh, in my department is looking at Virginia mycin, which is a, an antibiotic that you, you use in cows. You never use it in humans. And she wanted a resistant strain to Virginia mice. And I said, I'm not going to have one. Every single one of mine come from human beings, you know, and often dead people. So I said, let me check. And we checked, and I had one strain in my collection that was resistant to Virginia mice. And how? It shouldn't be there. I'm not speculating it came from food, but well, maybe I am. I don't know. You ingest food from the farm where you've had 70% of our antibiotics treated to. 
you ingest drug-resistant bacteria through there. It's, it's, it's not helping the cycle. And so some of this is beginning to get through. I mean, it's not just government, but government can help here. And so this is a quote from the chief medical officer of the UK and saying, antibiotic resistance is an apocalyptic scenario uh, posing a national emergency equivalent to that of a serious natural disaster or terrorism. I mean, it's a very harsh way of saying it, but frankly, it's kind of true. Uh, this is from Monday. This is Tom Frieden, the director of the CDC on Monday, said, if we're not careful, the medicine chest will be empty when we go to look for a life-saving antibiotic. And I already told you, that's pretty much true. He went on then to say, without urgent action now, more patients will be thrust back to a time before we ever had effective drugs. And so that's kind of where we are right now. And I, it's a bit doom and gloom, and it's kind of like, well, great, we're having such a great dinner, and then you ruined everything. <laughs> but... It's kind of true. We're almost at the post-antibiotic era. And so there was a phrase, the pre-antibiotic era, before we had drugs. Well, we are, and I've heard estimates eight to 10 years away from the post-antibiotic era, when we have no more antibiotics. And so then you have these bacteria, and you try and do whatever you can to them. Nothing works. And I'll tell you, when we had no antibiotics, 80% of Staph aureus infections were fatal. If you don't treat them 80% of the time, you will die. And so when you have no antibiotics, those numbers are going to get a lot worse. And so this is Margaret Chan. She's the chief medical officer of the World Health Organization. And she says, a post-antibiotic era means, in effect, an end to modern medicine as we know it. I would like to write that, but people not, might not believe me. This is the chief medical officer of the World Health Organization. Things as common as a strep throat or a scratched knee can kill again. And I'm not trying to make you all scared. This is exactly what happened. You know, children fall down, they get wounds, they get staph infections if you didn't have antibiotics. 80% of the time you might die. And so we're in a biological arms race. And this picture isn't the best one because this almost shows it's kind of catching up. The way I like to, to suggest it is the bugs are on the other side of the hill and running down the other side and we're barely halfway up. We are so far away from them, we're just not keeping pace. And so remember how I showed you this where you had the giant human skin cell 100 times bigger than that tiny stupid little bacteria? Well, the reality is a bit more like this. And I'm going to tell you, this is not the human being. And so that tiny thing that's 100 times smaller than your own cells is the big guy. It's the 500-pound gorilla in the room compared to what we think we know, what we think we can do. Four billion years of independent evolution tells you that these guys know exactly what to do to us, and they're just making us look silly right now. And so this is my final impending global doom slide. I've got a couple of slides before I finish about what we do in my lab. But the World Health Organization has labeled infectious diseases a crisis. But more importantly, antibiotic resistance is one of the three most important public health threats in the coming century. And I just go back to what Margaret Chan said, is that when we have the post-antibiotic era, we might as well give up on modern medicine because forget about being able to use radiotherapy to treat cancer patients because they're immunocompromised and infections will get them. Forget transplants, forget diabetes, forget heart disease, forget lung disease. If, if you can't treat simple infections, you know, it's kind of turn out the lights and hand in the keys kind of thing. So where does USF fit into all this after I've made you completely miserable now and, and everyone's just had enough and I want to go home? This is my gloriously wonderful bu building at USF. Well, it's not mine, although I sometimes wander around like it is. It's uh, my little fairy tale castle in the sky. And so we're up here on the sixth floor and I, the whole back wing of that side is my lab. And my office is just kind of there. So this is the ISA, the Interdisciplinary Sciences Building that opened two years ago, the biggest building on campus. It's, it's a world-class, state-of-the-art research facility. And I have friends come from NYU and big-name research places, and they want my office, and they want my lab, and I'm at USF. And so what do we do? And so in my lab, we do two things. And so the first thing is, and this whole molecular mechanism disease thing, so there's a picture of Staph aureus. We're trying to figure out how this thing that is 100 times smaller than our own cells kills people, because we have no idea. We have some clues, we have some theories, but we have no idea how this little tiny thing goes around causing so much damage. And so what we kind of call this is target identification. We're looking for pathways that are important in disease that affect virulence, and, and that's what a lot of my students do. Um, so I tell people, we're trying to find out how it kills people, and then on the other side of it, we're trying to kill it. And so the other side of what we do is we develop novel antimicrobials. And so, you know, pharma left the room, and so academia steps in, and so people like me and, and chemists and other people at USF try and figure out how to develop novel antimicrobials. And so um, I can't do this without them. So these are all my chemist collaborators. So a bunch of these guys, Bill Baker, Roman Manage, these mostly are all from um, the USF Department of Chemistry, although we have a strong collaboration now with Tory Pines over in Port St. Lucie on the East Coast too. And I don't know if some of you are chemists and some of you aren't, but if you've ever talked to a chemist and you see the hands, they're twitching, and all they want to do for you is draw you some structures. They just want to draw structures. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a biologist. This means nothing to me. And I tell them right out, don't draw me a structure. There's no point. And they still draw me a structure. And so you see how this... But I have a new student come into my lab who worked for Roman and is now 
working for me, and they talk and they understand each other. She sees structures, it's like R groups and substitutions, I don't know what you're talking about. Structures, but these are the things that potentially can fix stuff. These guys make it and I test it. And so we've had some success. So my lab's been fortunate. We've had three grants in the NIH now, the, 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 the federal place to get cash from, and I think hopefully have another one coming next summer. And, you know, we're, we're really kind of spearheading, trying to get some cash from the NIH. Um, and USF has been good to us. You know, we've had some kind of uh, understanding of what we've been doing, and then my terrified student back there, Whitney, who's hiding ahead right now. This was a, a picture that was taken of us when I won the research award. And so Whitney has done a lot of the drug discovery work. She's got eight, nine papers now already, and she's a fourth year grad student, and she's on the patent that I'm going to reference in a moment. But so, you know, we're doing what we can here, and we're trying to do our bit. And so, yeah, where next is um, we filed a patent on a, a series of compounds against structures. I'm told that this is exciting, but I don't know what it is. But it's a patent with Roman Manich and his student, and then me and Whitney, my student. And so we like these drugs. We're writing a grant to the NIH right now for a couple million dollars. Hopefully they'll help us develop those into, you know, we have a good start. We need to take them to preclinical development, so maybe pharma can pick them up and, and run with them. And so we have this one on the way, and I've got maybe three or four in the pipeline that I really like the look of that are promising in our early kind of testings that we can do with the, the kind of cash and funds that we have lying around. But we still have a long way to go, and it kind of feels like you're in the Escher picture a lot of the time because you kind of go up here and then it's like, but I was just over there, and how do I get back? So we've got a long way to go. Um, I mean, this is a long, exhaustive process, and it takes a long time. Those, those compounds there, we've been working on those things for four years, and we're now just writing the paper and the grant on it because it took a long time to get the development, although we just tested these in animals, which is the model. You infect an animal, then you put the drug in, does it work? And it actually does. It works really, really well. So we're excited about those. So we have a long way to go. And this is really what success is. You know, people think, oh, okay, you find an antibiotic, you cure mankind and all problems. But <laughs> there's a lot of time spent in there, honestly. So that's it. I mean, that's what I had to tell you about. This is my group at USF. Um, this is the picture that we take every year of them. They decided they want to do the comedy picture this year. And so that's them all being kind of crazy. I refuse to be drawn into that kind of nonsense. But... Uh, I have a great group of people, a lot of students, uh, postdocs, lab manager, all kind of focused on trying to figure out how Staph aureus kills people and hopefully trying to find ways to kill it. And so uh, hopefully I haven't scared you too much. And maybe if you have any questions, I'd love to answer them. A hand right up at the back. Wow. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I hate to be a rumor monger or a scare monger, although clearly I am. I'm good at it, I suppose. But yeah, so if you've got animals and you fill them full of antibiotics and there are bacteria inside them, and yeah, you'll get most of the antibiotics, maybe even 99.9% .9 of the antibiotics, but that 0.1% of bacterial terms is still about a million different bacteria. So then you create resistant antibiotic, uh, resistant microbes, cut up a slice of meat, ship it off to home. And that's where food safety, I have, my in-laws are staying with me right now, and I'm having a conversation. It's a lot of fun with you in Lozano. I was happy to come. Um, no, they're great to me. My extended American family, they've been good to me. Um, uh, but we were talking about food handling. And so I'm not a germaphobe, but I know what you need to deal with. And so when you touch raw meat, the very first thing you do is wash your hands because you have to treat every single thing of, that's not cooked meat as contaminated. And guaranteed it is, Turn, certainly ground beef. And it depends where you get it from. And so depending on if you touch it and then touch something else before you wash your hands and it's now there, and so you might not ingest it with the food. And if you do, you'll go through the, the gastric acid barrier. And so you'll probably be okay unless it's an E. coli. But you know, it might now kind of smear it around and the kid gets it or you get it. You touch a, your eye or a cut. And so there's the ability to disseminate stuff within a home. And, and that's now a resistant strain that you really didn't need to be dealing with if we weren't giving all this stuff to cows and, and sheep in the first place. It's like you, you just answer things horribly, so I don't want to tell you. <laughs> Say something nice. So if, if I were a billionaire, if I were a multi-billionaire, <laughs> and I gave you a billion dollars, yes. how long would it take you to figure out the answer to the problem? A billion dollars would be a lot quicker than a million dollars, for example. You know, I mean, a uh, billion dollars we could do an awful lot very quickly with. You know. You never solve it, though. I mean, that's the thing. You develop, you, but you need to keep the, the supply chain going. You know, farmer dropping out of the, the market meant that the bugs got a run on us. And so we had all this time where we weren't developing antibiotics, and so we had nothing to go after them with. 
you know, a million dollars would do an awful lot. You can buy instrumentation, you can buy resources, you can get the, the, the chemists making the compounds. And that's the, the, the bottleneck is um, the chemists making the compounds, which is incredibly laborious and complicated, and then giving it to us, and we can screen them pretty quick, give the information back, and then we make a new molecule and we test it, and then, well, okay, it works, but now what else does it do? What are its properties? Is it soluble? Does it transport across membranes? There are so many places along the way for drug discovery where things get triaged because it's very complicated. To put something in the human body that will kill the bug but not the human is really complex because the human body loves to start tinkering with everything you give it and so the liver is going to start to detoxify things or change into new pro-drugs that end up being toxic and causing a heart attack or something and so manpower and resources would change a lot. Um, you know, the Center for Drug Discovery and Innovation, we just wrote a $25 million grant that's reviewed in the next couple of weeks, and that's to give us, you know, the kind of money to, it was, it was a call that said, look, if we give you a boatload of cash, what could you do with it? And our proposal was very simple. You give us money, we'll give you product, because we have all these drugs and compounds, we're ready to start screening, we'll just high throughput all this stuff, we'll buy robots, we'll get lots of students, and we'll just knock it through. And at the end of it, you know, we might not have, I think my, my grant alone, we proposed to have 300 new antibiotics at the end of it with three or four million bucks. I mean, you could do it if you had the money, but farmer aren't investing in it anymore, and universities do what they can. I'm reliant on the National Institute of Health to fund, and, and you know, with Sequester and all those other things, the NIH funding lines are going way down. I mean, 10 years ago, 20% of grants got funded. This year, 8% of grants are gonna get funded. I've got some good ideas. Do I have an 8% quality grant? I, you know, I think a couple of them are, but I, I can't be sure. And so there's so much stuff that's going unfunded in terms of federal government, and that's kind of where we're reliant on, so. Cash will do it. Yes? Uh, when the drug companies stop making drugs, for example, tetracycline, yeah. does that mean they found out that it doesn't work anymore? Well, and that's, uh, it's kind of funny. I sit on a lot of grant review panels looking at drug grants, and you'll have pharma guys there too, and you'll get a proposal come across, and they're like, oh, this looks fantastic. And pharma goes, yeah, we tried that 10 years ago. It doesn't work. And they don't tell you this stuff. But at Pharma, they don't have the license to do the things that we can do. And so I have a good friend who's at the University of Rochester, but he used to run drug discovery at Wyeth for years. And he said, you know, you get one shot in Pharma to do your assay. You can't model it, you can't fix it, you can't tweak it, you got it, you line it up, you do it, it doesn't work, you're done. You know, at universities, we don't have shareholders, and so we have the time to maybe tweak it and think about it. And then someone come up with a crazy idea, and then, oh, actually, that worked. And so... Some of it's because pharma figured out it didn't work, but it's also because the way they do things. You know, they're high throughput to make money, and time is money. And for me, well, time is money too, but not in the same way. I have the chance to think intellectually about a problem for a week and then come back with a new idea. It might work, it might not, but thankfully I don't have a shareholder breathing down my neck saying, hey, you're fired if you don't get this thing done. So it, it's kind of the model. Yes, my man. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, TB is the other one. I mean, think if you take the six escape pathogens, you add TB to it, and then something called C. diff, Clostridium difficile, that's the entirety of the problem. I mean, there are other things that cause problems, but those eight guys are it. Um, there's something called NDM1, the New Delhi metallobetalactamase resistance gene, and so it started in, in India, and, and this was a gene that popped up over there, and all of a sudden, all the strains that they had um, of various different Enterobacteriaceae, you couldn't treat them anymore. And this was kind of a big blip. You know, evolution of things kind of goes like this. This was a huge jump in, oh dear God, what's, what just happened? And NDM1's now spreading around all over the world because of travel. And so, yeah, I mean, uh, I remember seeing, so vancomycin was the big drug for Staph aureus and resistance occurred in early 2000s. And I was able to stay, say, still in kind of 2007, 2008, Thankfully, we've only had nine cases, six of which were in Michigan. I have no idea what's going on in Michigan. But, but I've seen a bunch of studies that in India that suggest, well, you guys, you guys have got nine. Everything in our hospital is vancomycin resistant. And we're seeing that global spread of things now. And so the Middle East as well, we're seeing that. And, and then it goes back to the idea that the compliance with taking antibiotics is different. So for malaria, for example, a non-bacteria for a second, when one develops a malaria drug, you can't rely on the patients to keep taking it once a week regularly. You have to have a one shot and done because they just don't think about treatment and health in the same way that we do in this country. And so treatment in, in developing countries is not the same as it is in developed countries. And so you can't rely on the patients to finish the course of antibiotics, to not share them with people. And so they're a breeding ground for things that just get spread and becomes pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Sure. 
-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and so actually some of that has worked. Um, but it's funny, I, you know, I can read ten, I've read probably about 10 studies in the last year. Half of them say, yes, it really does work, and half of them say it makes no difference. Um, it certainly makes things a lot better, you know, because the, the way back when, in, you know, 200 years ago, kind of in, in England, um, surgeons were considered to be really good if they had a lot of blood on their white coat, because it meant that they'd done a lot of surgeries, and so they were you know, really experienced. But really all it meant was they had a lot of stuff on there that were going to infect and kill all their patients. You know, as recent as 10, 15 years ago, Doctors, ties, tie pins, pens with a great place, touch patient, write something down, transmit it all over the hospital. Now when we find Mercer and when you go to a hospital, you see it, you get locked down. If someone's got Mercer and that's it, you lock them down. And it does make a difference. Um, but I would say part of the problem is that if you go in for an, uh, a surgery, and so let's say you go in to get a plate in your arm or something like that, and you end up with a Mercer infection, almost always it's your own strain that you got that you got the infection with. It's not from a, a nurse, it's not from a doctor. Your own strain, which is in your nose and kind of on you, and you can try as much as you want to clean people, typically isn't one that infects you. Although there are also other studies where you see, I mean, an anesthetist, I read this kind of just a couple of days ago, huge problem in one ICU, and they tracked it back to one anesthetist, and everyone who had that guy got a Mercer infection kind of thing. And so isolation um, and surveillance was kind of some of the stuff that the, the WHO was talking about. It does make a difference. Um, so I would never, wouldn't advocate against that stuff. I think it probably is helping, but uh, it's not helping enough. Yes? So when I go shopping at Publix, <laughs> and, I, and I see the dial advertisement for antibacterial soap, is that good or bad? I would actually say bad. I, I wouldn't touch it. Um, because <laughs> all you're doing is, again, overusing something that you don't need to use all the time. Straight up soap is, is fine. You know, I mean, it's been around forever and it works fine. You know, as long as people don't wander around picking their nose and sticking it in their eyeballs, because that's <laughs> bugs up there. If you just clean about your practice, you know, I mean, again, not being a germaphobe, because every single day, in fact, today, every single one of you was challenged with a bacteria that will kill you, and none of you are sick, because inside, you know, 10 times more bacterial cells than your own cells, there's a good, healthy flora that looks after you. And so these invading guys come in, start trying to cause trouble, and your own guys are like, get out of here, we got this stuff, but, you know, go away, we'll outcompete you, we'll eat all the food, and you're not going to hang around. So. We're all challenged all the time with this stuff and it doesn't get us. And so we need that kind of low level challenge for immunity. And so when you take people's blood and say, all right, what do you have antibodies against? What, what have you seen in your life? Pretty much everything's in there. You've made antibodies against every single infecting agent because when you were a kid, you used to roll around in the dirt, you know? And it's a good thing. So the idea of sterilizing a house and living in a bubble means you have no immune system, no ability to be uh, effective against challenge every day. And also, you know, kind of breeding resistance type thing. You're selecting and selecting again for this. And it's usually kind of triclosan, I think, that they put in, in the soaps. You know, we're just waiting for a triclosan epidemic of resistance. So it, it may be a good thing if you solely use it when you've been playing with meat, but for completely forever household use, no, I, I, I don't, we don't buy it in my house. Yes? Yeah, and so that stuff's good for your own in, in internal flora. And so one of the things you see, so C. diffs, Clostridium difficile is a huge problem. And so what happens is when one takes antibiotic therapy, you eliminate everything that is your good bugs inside you. Uh, and what happens is so this bug called C. diff, is, it's kind of mean, it's kind of bad, but it usually sits there and is, the other guys keep it in check. When everything else goes away, it's like, great, the parents went away, I'm going to have a party. <laughs> and so you get this colitis, uh, uh, I forget what it's called. Anyway. Yeah, colitis. And so... You get this huge, serious problem, and, and C. diff kills a bunch of people. And you know how you fix a C. diff infection? Fecal transplant. You, you take someone else's fec uh, stool, and you deposit it in the stomach. You get your good bacteria again, and infection cures it every time. But if you don't do that, antibiotics don't work. So yeah, there's absolutely something to be said for, your, uh, for, for eating yogurt, particularly if you're on antibiotic therapy, and just keeping your own flora in check. It really does help. And there are some great studies that show something called Lactococcus lactis, which is in those yogurts you're eating, outcompetes Staph aureus. It's got this thing that it makes, and it kills Staph aureus. And so, yeah, th there's absolutely a good component to it. Although, again, when one tries to let biological agent, biological agent wage war and say, all right, guys, Go off and mis don't misbehave. Don't do anything we don't want you to do. You know they're going to do whatever they want. But in general, it's a good thing. Let's thank Dr. Shaw. Uh, thank you so much. Sure. I don't know if I need to. Have a seat.